I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. Hope everybody had a, a wonderful day. I'm sure it was busy, but it's glad to see everybody out. I love this weather. This is the perfect time of the year. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. I've asked our brother Mike Whitaker to lead us in prayer, so I'll turn it over to Mike at this time. Let's all pray. Almighty Father, thank you for the beautiful day that you've given to us. Thank you for the health that we've got to allow us to come together at this time to study your word. We pray, Father, that you be with each and every one of us, that we will have open minds and, and listen to the things that uh, from your word that guides us in life. Uh, be with Gerald and give him a ready recollection of the things that he has studied and, and prepared and give him easy thoughts to present it in a manner that is most beneficial to each one of us. We, Father, we thank you for this congregation. We, we know that we've got several of our number that are sick and need your healing hand. We ask that you be with them. We've had families that have lost loved ones recently. We ask that you be with them. Father, we thank you for everything that you do for us. We ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Okay, for next Wednesday, we're going to be doing the labors in the vineyard, Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. I forgot to do a slide because that's what happens. I get so focused on what I'm doing, I, I forget about the future. I'm, I'm getting honed in on, but anyway, Matthew chapter 20, labors in the vineyard. It's good to see everybody out tonight. We're going to do the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, this is brand new material for me because I have never, since I started preaching and teaching in 1999, I have never taught about the ten virgins. So, uh, so if I get this wrong tonight, please, uh, please help me out here. But I uh, uh, did learn a lot going through this one and we'll add it to my, to my lessons in the future. So um, Matthew chapter 25, if you want to go ahead and turn there. I always like to start off by talking about what a parable is. I think it's very, very important. Uh, to place beside or cast along uh, the known uh, before the unknown or the known beside the unknown or what we commonly call the earthly story, the heavenly meaning. So as we go through the story tonight, we'll be thinking about that earthly or that known and then the unknown, that spiritual, what God is trying to teach us from this lesson. And so we'll be able to go through that. So um, how do you prepare for something? Doug, how do you prepare for something? You think ahead? Yeah, you think through it. All right. Anybody else? Make a list. Lists are good. Anybody else? How do you prepare? Study? Rehearse it. I love the rehearsing part. Yeah, my, my people at work hate me for that because I make them do it like 10 times before we do it. Consult others, yeah. Consult others is good. Anybody else? Research. Yeah, research is amazing, absolutely. Plan it out. Uh, my family probably hates me a little bit because I, I plan on vacation. I don't know if it's just because of work because I do it at work, but I plan what time we're going to get up and what time we do everything all day long, every day through the entire vacation. So I already have everything booked. We don't have to go, hmm, what are we going to eat today? Well, look at the book. And I, my kids I get annoyed with me because I create a book for them. Everybody gets a book. They get the schedule in the book. They get to open it up. It's all got pictures. And it's very cool, actually. At least I think it is. And so they keep bugging me. And they're like, what are we doing today? And I'm like, I'm not telling you because I gave you a book. Turn to Tuesday at 3 o'clock. It will tell you what we're doing today. And uh, so, but you plan ahead. It's there. You know, you schedule it all out. You know, uncertainty. I hate uncertainty. Uh, at work. I, I, I plan most of the things that I do in my current job, even though the people who work for me think I, I do day-to-day -day stuff, most things I do are things that are going to happen two years from now. You know, I'm working on future adoptions. Like right now, I had a meeting this morning at 7.30. Funny story, if you want to hear a really funny story. I, I got a doctor's appointment. I created it. They had a 7.30 opening. I said, I'm going to do, I'm going to do your 7.30. And I said, I will not have a conference call at 7.30 in the morning. I will not have a work schedule. I will not have anything. That would be a great time to do 7.30. Last night at 6 o'clock, they put a call on my calendar at 7.30 because nobody else was available in the entire company until 7, 7.30. 
So I am literally laying on this table, and they're doing a cut right here on me. I have no shirt on with my headphone in, and I'm, I'm doing a call, a national call. Anyway, nobody knows it but the doctor, and he just paid no attention to me. So anyway, planning things. I'm surprised he let me do it. He didn't really give a rip, so maybe he thought it kept me calm. Anyway, so preparing, having things planned out. I mean, you know, you do it. Now, there are people, and you won't believe this, that fly by the seat of their pants. Kim, do you ever get any customers who call and say, school started yesterday and I haven't ordered my books yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I get a haircut? There you go. Can I get out and leave for vacation? I believe that 90% of all Americans procrastinate because I deal with them, especially teachers. I only deal with education people, but, oh, the calls that we get the first three weeks of school. I'm like, you had all summer to order your workbooks and to order. You knew school was starting on August the 8th. But they call on August the 7th, and they want it overnighted until we give them the overnight price of 1,000 books. And then they're like, no, 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 overnight, overnight. Two days is fine, you know, three days, whatever. So being prepared. 1999, I love 1999 because I could say I'm going to party like 1999. We could do uh, the Prince song, which, by the way, uh, is one of our elders' favorite singers. I'm not going to tell you which one. I'll let you figure that out on your own. But you can say, what are you going to do? I'm going to party like it's 1999. Does anybody remember the theme of 1999? Don't tell me it's just me. Y2K, the end of the world. And where I grew up in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, was uh, what I call a bunch of country people. You may refer to them as a bunch of rednecks. Um, they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Man, it was awesome. Man, they were... They were buying these food things, which I do have a couple of these, by the way. I don't have enough for all of you if something happens, but I have enough for a couple weeks. You know, there's food containers. They were, they were digging holes in the ground. I mean, we got, I, where I live, there's probably 500 bomb shelters in the ground that are not being used right now. So if you need a bomb shelter, Lawrence County, Tennessee, there was a bunch of them there. They're preparing the food. You saw these people, uh, gas masks and suits and you know, it's going to click to 2,000 and everything is going to go nuts. And I kind of believed it a little bit. I think we all kind of were like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, maybe. And so you saw that. You know, they even came up to show Doomsday Preppers. And we, we, we joke about people who are like, oh, are you a prepper? Are you a prepper? I've been accused of being a prepper, by the way. I don't really know why. But, uh, you know, you Doomsday Prepping, the bomb shelters or the little holes in the ground, the shelters and... Some of these are very nice, by the way. That's a picture of one of them. Uh, you know, they had their own homes. I mean, they got it all done, locked and ready to go. They're preparing. They thought the end of the world was coming, and they were preparing uh, for that. So preparation, I think we'd all agree, is key. Procrastination, not so good, right? It's interesting that so many times in our religious thinking, Procrastination is what we, or most people, tend to go with. And preparedness is like, eh, I'll put it off till tomorrow. I'll put that off till tomorrow. Tomorrow, next week, next month, right? And so you have this whole thing that you do. And so that gets us to this parable. Now, you're probably saying, well, that's the stupidest statement, Gerald. This is Jesus' parable. Well, duh, who else? whose parable would it be? I say that because there's a lot of commentators that have debated about, well, this parable is just, you know, ridiculous. Like, I don't understand, um, you know, why this happens in this parable. It doesn't make sense that they wouldn't open the door at the end. They're knocking. Why wouldn't they open? Or why would this happen? Or, or you know, it's about the feast or it's this. And so um, I read somebody say in one of the commentaries, they said, hey, it's Jesus' parable. He can do whatever he wants to in his parable. He's, he's the one who told it. It's his parable. So as we go through this and you see something, you're like, huh. That's strange. Like, doesn't make any, doesn't matter. It's Jesus' parable. It's not yours. So if you want to create your own parable, you know, you, you can do that. I mean, parables are easy to write, right? So anyway, so I just throw that out there because it's Jesus' parable. So first verse here, 25 and verse 1. So you can turn to verse uh, chapter 25. We're actually going to go verse by verse on this one. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom kind of starts kind of odd here. He's in a series of different things. He's at the end of his life here in Matthew chapter 25. 
He's going to do a series of things. He's going to tell a parable right after this parable, and he's going to go into multiple parables. And I mean, he's just spitting out all kinds of information here. And then he gets to this one. The kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen ten weddings happen at the same time before, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then, you know, kind of meeting the groom and, and how these things happen. So I'm not sure why he chose the numbers here. There's no significance to it, but he did. Ten virgins here, and they're going to meet it. Jewish weddings are a little different than ours today. Um, they kind of went through a betrothal process, um, and you would be uh, basically being engaged was being married. And you're saying, well, how is that possible? Well, I don't really understand Jewish customs completely, but if you notice here in Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 19, Joseph says here, I have to put her away, saying basically, I have to divorce Mary here. And he says here, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah was followed when his mother had, made, had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together. She was found to be pregnant in the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, since he has a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly or put her away. So I know uh, Curtis had talked some about this, Dr. Pope, when he was here about the Jewish customs and what they did, but, but it's different than ours. So uh, from what we can understand, an engagement is basically saying or, or, or practically being married. And, but there was a process, there was a time period of this betrothal. And somebody here may know a little more about that than I. Uh, if anyone wants to add anything to that. And also, one of the customs would have been is that the bridegroom would rejoice, you know, with his friends uh, during the day to, pr to proceed home with the bride. Uh, some have suggested that there had been a festive event. So during the day or the morning, the groom would have been out with his buddies partying or hanging out or getting together, doing whatever they're doing. And the wedding would have taken place at night. And that would have been the custom. So they would have come back. The family would have been there. The, the, uh, the bridesmaid or the bride would have waited and the groom would have come. And then when he got there, then that would have finalized or got into the, the wedding festivities for the night. And so um, there's a couple of passages here that, were, that are referenced for this. I think they're loose passages on this. I mean, I wouldn't use them as concrete passages to say this, but it does talk a little bit about the events here in Psalms and Matthew as well. And so, so here, this custom, if, if it's the bride, the, the groom is out all day and the bride is waiting... Um, you can kind of see this whole process rolling out uh, in this. And so five of them were foolish, and five of them were prudent. Um, I found that immediately uh, interesting here that, that Jesus is like, hey, there, there are five that weren't too bright, they were foolish, and there were five that were smart in what they did. And, uh, and, and so I kind of throw this out here to you. Uh, can this be debated? Who was foolish and who was prudent? So, for argument's sake, I'll throw it out there to you. So, um, why would you need to take extra oil for it? I mean, what's the whole point? I mean, the person taking extra oil, wouldn't that kind of be kind of dumb? I mean, you know, he's going to come at like 8 or 9 o'clock at night, right? I mean, can you imagine the ones who had all the oil probably being made fun of for taking... Why are you taking all this oil? You're a prepper. You're, you're a planner. You're, you're going a little crazy here. What, what are you doing? And the other ones are like, hey, I'm taking just enough. You know, I got other things to pack. I got my wedding dress. I got my veil. I got, you know, all my shoes. I don't have time to take some extra oil. And so debating which ones are foolish, depending on at the time of the event, you may, you may think that. Um, and uh, so it's kind of interesting here on that. For instance, as a Christian, oh, you go to, why do you go to church so much? Why do you study your Bible so much? Well, you know, the kingdom is at hand. Oh, you're young. You don't need to worry about that. I mean, you know, nothing's going to happen. You know, you don't need to be so prepared. Why are you so prepared all the time for? You know, nothing's going to happen this week or tonight or next month. And so you can see how people may in our religious life look at us as foolish or prudent, depending on the circumstance that they're in. Could excuses be made for the foolish girls? So, can you make an excuse for them? Have I already made them for them? 
What would have been reason not to take any more oil, you think, besides what I've talked about? Any other reason? They had so many shoes. You know, they had their wedding gown, and then they had their gown after to get married, you know, and the jewelry and all the stuff for that, you know. Hey, he loves me. He's going to be here at 6 o'clock. He doesn't like hanging out with his friends. He's going to be here early. I think they very well could have made excuses. Um, and that's probably why they didn't take the oil. Um, I mean, because they had a reason why they didn't, right? I mean, there was a, there was a reason why they only took what they thought they needed. Um, and obviously it wasn't enough. And so, but making excuses doesn't get you where you need to be at. And so many times we make excuses about why we can or can't do something. But in, in the end, we should have done what was right and been prepared for whatever it was we were and in our spiritual life doing the right things. And so we have to be careful of trying to do just enough or, or, or doing, doing a little not enough and using that as an excuse. See, they thought they were doing just enough, and yet they weren't doing quite enough here. Absolutely, yes, sir. You need 100 bucks on vacation, take 300 right, Jim? Because the 100 will be gone for the first meal. No, I'm kidding, yeah. For when the foolish took their lamps... They did not take extra oil with them. And so Jesus points out that they were being foolish because they did not take any extra oil. They took just enough. They were doing the bare minimum. That's what he's saying here. They, they, took, they took what they thought they needed. Uh, just enough. Not any extra, not any in abundance. They were doing the bare minimum that they needed to do in order to be able to get through the situation. You know, if my wedding's on the line, I don't think I'm going to do bare minimum. I don't know. I tried not to do that. My wife's in here. She may call me out on this. But, you know, you, 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 it's your wedding day, right? You go over just a little bit, don't you? You go, you know, you're preparing. Uh, huh? And you might get locked out. Yeah. Do we have any people that did just the bare minimum? Anybody in their weddings and got caught? Anybody? Alan, you didn't do that, did you? You don't seem like a minimalist there. It seems like you were a smart guy. All right, I'm going to go ask your mother-in-law, though, so I'll leave that, leave that alone. Oh, you just, they said, be here. Don't bring anything. Just be here at 6 o'clock. <laughs> okay, so they took their lamps. They did not take anything extra with them. So I want to point out that in Jesus' parable here. And I asked the question, why would you take any extra oil? Or for that matter, anything extra? He's going to come. You're going to get married. Jesus, what's the point here? Why do I need to take anything extra? I'm just going to do just enough. And you might say, he's going to come early. He's been waiting to marry me for 72 weeks. He can't wait to be here. Right? Right? He's been counting it down. He's going to be here at 3 o'clock. He's not going to come in at midnight. Right? I don't see the ladies real confident about this. You know, he's going to be there early. Uh, especially when there's no time set. Could you imagine that, ladies? Like, there's no time set for your wedding, like the actual wedding day in this particular story. You know, we get married when he shows up. <laughs> anybody like that idea? Anybody? All right. I don't think anybody likes it. Either. I don't think these ladies liked it either. Well, maybe five of them did. They were okay with it. So maybe they think he was going to come early. Maybe they thought they had too much to begin with. But, but they did not take any extra. They did not plan ahead. And it says here in verse 4, but the prudent ones, they took oil in a flask with their lamps. And so they took more than they needed. They were prepared. They thought through it, uh, through the whole thing. They, they, hey, this guy, I've been dating this guy for five years. He ain't been on time for anything. So I better make sure I got some extra oil. I'm sure that was what was going through their head. Probably not, but I'm sure maybe they were thinking that. And so they were prepared. They got the extra oil. Did they look foolish at first? And why are you taking so much oil? You'll never need it. You ever hear those naysayers, you know? Why are you doing X? You know, it'll, you'll never, ever be able to use all of that. Or you'll never be able to do that. Or... You've, you've planned too far ahead. That's too much. You'll never. 
Anybody ever heard that before? I hear that every once in a while. I get a little carried away when I do stuff, so. Huh? Oh, man, Noah heard it all the time. It's never rained. What do you do? Well, they didn't say rain because it, it actually had never rained. So what are you doing, Noah? That's a great one, by the way. I like your dad. He's, he's good. Yeah, there you go. That's a great one. People, for 100 years, he got made fun of. What are you doing? You'll never need it. It's never going to happen. And, and maybe this happened. We don't know all the details of the story. It's a parable. And so that could very well could have taken place. And so we see they took extra. And, and so I pose a question here. Do you prepare for the unknown? Who here prepares for the unknown? Anybody prepare for the unknown? Every woman carries a wheelbarrow full of stuff. Every woman carries a wheelbarrow full of stuff. All right. I didn't say that. For the record, it was Jim over here. But Jim, you like it though when you're you need some eye drops, right? That's right. Or you need that band aid or the Tide pen? I need the Tide pen a lot. I'm like, give me that Tide pen. Uh, Right, right, being prepared, yeah. Yeah, well, the, the unknown was they didn't know when he was going to come. He could come at, he could have come at 2 o'clock, he could have come at 9 o'clock, and just as Jesus has said to us, I, I don't know what, he said, I don't even know when I'm coming. We don't know. He know he will. So we have to prepare, we have to be able to be prepared for the unknown. There's no doubt about it. Go ahead. Why do you buy insurance? I don't want to die by the time I'm 55, but I'm covered in case I do. For the unknown. Okay? And the insurance principle is built on that very thing. You could. It could happen. This is a possibility. And, uh, and, 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 and there you are on that situation here. Darkness. Um, something we don't think about in this story is what, why do they need lamps to begin with? Why do they need oil for lamps? Um, one of the things that, that you, don't, you don't get to experience in Bowling Green it is funny. We had some people from New York City come to our house. And we do live in the country. Most people, I think, have been in our, in our home. And yes, at night, you can look up in the stars, and you can see the stars, and it, it is pretty. But I grew up in the middle of nowhere. Matter of fact, I grew up about 10 miles left of the middle of nowhere. No street lights, no cities anywhere nearby. I mean, when it is no moon out at night and it's dark, you cannot see your hand. <laughs> it is dark. I imagine during this time period, that's how it was everywhere. At night, it was dark. Um, we don't experience that in Bulgarian. There's a light somewhere everywhere. It, 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 we, we don't live in a dark world, which is fine. I like that. I don't like dark because people can hide and do stuff, and that's why we have, have it lit. But, but having light is important in this dark uh, place, and that's why it was so important to have this, be able to see each other and have the light. And, and, and I, think that, I think that's interesting here of, of him pointing this out. Why they had to have light to begin with to get married? Well, because it was nighttime and they couldn't see each other. And, uh, and they needed to have that light because of the darkness uh, that was around them. And I used a picture here to talk about what stars look like. And so verse 5, now while the groom was delaying, they all became drowsy and they began to sleep. Hey, that's me. About 9 o'clock, if I get still, I'm out. Doesn't matter what I'm doing or where we're at, right? Anybody else like that? Where you get tired and you're waiting up and, and, and he's telling this story. That's pretty common. We're used to that. That's something that we, we're familiar with. You're waiting by yourself. You're waiting for somebody to come. It's dark. It's nighttime. They're not there. And they fall asleep. They have their light there. And, uh, and we see that that happens. Sometimes it feels like it takes something forever to happen when you're waiting, right? You ever done that? You're waiting on somebody and it's just like... They're going to be here, especially when somebody's late. When they're late, you know, every minute is like six minutes, right? It's like it's even longer. Like you can actually see the hands as they're moving. And, and I talked about watching water boil. You know, it's so boring. Like you're just sitting there and you're watching it. You know it's going to do it at 212 degrees. 
and, and you, know, you put salt in there trying to get it to speed up. You raise it up in the air because higher the altitude, it'll boil. I'm kidding about raising it up. But anyway, so, you, you know, you, you just wait. But the more you wait, the more you don't think it's going to happen. And the more, you know, whatever, you just you get lost. And, and, and they went to sleep. Who knew if they knew whether he was going to come or not? Maybe they were going to wake up in the next morning. You know, who knows? Um, but they fell asleep and, and waiting for him. But at midnight, uh, there finally was a shout, verse 6. Behold, the groom came out to meet him. At midnight. That's an interesting hour of night to get married and to finish off your betrothal. But anyway, that's the time period that they came. They came at midnight, and they're hollering, and they're, they're here, and there's a big shout. Behold, the groom came out here to meet him. So they jump up. You know, I'm sure they're fixing their hair. You know, they're brushing their teeth. I don't know. They're getting their light. You know, the groom is here. Finally, he's here for these festivities, for this wedding event, and he's here uh, with us. Then all the virgins got up, and they trimmed their lamps. Uh, we don't do a lot of that anymore, but what, why would you trim your lamp? What happens to your lamp that needs to be trimmed? Anybody? Yeah, it gets carbonite, and it's kind of burning weird, and, and so they, they trim it so you have a clean burn. And I guess at that point, they examine uh, their lamps. Behold, the foolish virgin said to the uh, prudent ones, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. Now, when you read this for the first time, you're thinking, well, why didn't they give them some oil? Matter of fact, that seems very logical, would it not, to share? Isn't that a, isn't that a biblical principle? Isn't that a Christian principle? You got abundance of something to share it? Right? Shouldn't they have shared it? Yeah? Okay. They had enough? Okay. All right. However, the prudent ones answered, no, we're not going to give you any. There most certainly would not be enough, as you said, the abundance for us and you to go. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. They say, hey, we don't have enough. We're not giving you any. You got to go out. You got to go buy some. Are the prudence virgins being selfish? Sensible. Yeah. And, and some may argue that. It's one of the things I read. Some said, well, they're just being selfish. Why didn't they help them out? I mean, all they cared about was themselves. But maybe what they have, they couldn't share. And uh, I think that is... Uh, that is interesting. I'm going to read something to you about that. I want you to think about it. I want you to listen to what he said in this book. It's pretty amazing. And he says it better than I said it. This is uh, Paul Earnhardt, his thoughts on that. And it blew my mind when I read it. He said, A subsidiary lesson of this parable is the most responsibility in Christ-like in our relationship to him personally. We cannot li uh, be lit uh, vicariously by the spiritual light that burns in others. There is no way to borrow a pure heart or a godly character in a crisis. Such things cannot be rented or suddenly passed on. They have to be personally chosen and cultivated. Parents cannot fail for years to train their children in righteousness and then expect some godly individual to magically deliver them in a moment from disaster. We cannot live our lives with indifferences to internal things and expect our way through the valley of the shadow to be lit by the oils of others' faith. The righteousness of others will, will save us, uh, will not save us in the judgment. And I'll talk about Ezekiel in a minute and I'll show you those passages. He's saying that others can't, they can't do it for us. I can't say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm not very Christian-like right now, but my parents were. So I'm going to borrow my parents' Christianity and that's going to get me into heaven. They can't give it to me. They have just enough. They don't have an abundance. They have their faith. They're giving it to them. And, and so you can't do that. I can't loan my kids. My kids have to get their own faith. They have to be able to do it. I, can't, I can teach them, but I can't give it. I can't give what I have. What I have is what I need. And I think it's interesting how Jesus points that out here in this parable, that they had an abundance, but they didn't have an abundance. They had what they need, but they couldn't give it, because if they did, they wouldn't be able to do it.
Yet extra time was given, and what'd they do? They slept right along with everybody else and waited to that very last minute, and they couldn't do anything about it. And, and, and that's, that's an interesting point. I think Paul did a great job. Verse 10, but while they were on their way to buy the oil, the groom came. And those uh, who were ready went in and him the wedding feast. And the door was shut. And so uh, they all went in, the five virgins who had the oil. The five foolish ones uh, obviously were out buying and they did not. Yet later the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. And so this is one of the things that people argue, well, and if it was a real wedding, they would have let them in. They're not going to keep the bride from getting married. I mean, they're not going to, they're not going to prevent that. And she so was like, well, this parable is kind of, well, no, this is, this is Jesus' parable. And he's teaching a, a, a spiritual lesson here with this parable. The time came, and they weren't ready, and the door shut, and they weren't allowed to go in. Almost saved, but lost. Almost saved, but lost. The door had shut. And it says, but he answered truly and say to you, I do not know you. They're knocking. But he says, I don't know who you are. I don't know what's going on here. And he says, be on alert then because you do not know the day or the hour. And so in this particular parable, Jesus is teaching us, we don't know when the time of this coming back is going to be. But we have to be prepared. And if we're not prepared, um, we're going to have a problem. And so here's the application. I did this kind of odd. So kind of go along with me on this. I, I think it works. So we must be prepared. I think everybody agrees with that, right, from this parable. We must be prepared. If we're not prepared, we're going to be in trouble. We must be prepared and ready at all times. Anybody disagree with that? Can you be prepared but ready some of the time? Part of the time? Or do you have to be ready all the time? I don't know if silence is you're agreeing with me or you're disagreeing with me right now. That's right. So we, so we got to be ready all the time. Like it's, it's like an ongoing thing. It's not like, yeah, you know, I'm going to be ready between... My 50s and my 70s and uh, maybe my 40s I'm going to take off. And then my 20s and my 30s maybe I'll be on. And, you know, I'll kind of mix it in there. Maybe Monday through Friday I'll be ready. But Saturday and Sunday I'm not ready. Is that how it works? No. Because you don't know. He came, he came at midnight. They didn't know when he was going to come. We must be prepared and must be ready at all times. We must be prepared and ready at all times because we don't know the hour of the Lord's return. We don't know. And in Matthew chapter 24, 44, For this reason you must be ready as well, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think He will. We do not know. We don't know when our time is up. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know what time they're coming. There's going to be a shout like the ladies here, the bridegroom is here. There's going to be a shout. And, and they're going to be here, and you're either going to be ready or you're not going to be ready. And, and that, that's, that's the truth of the matter. Uh, this is not a scare tactic by any means. This is just telling you the truth. Um, we, we have to be ready. We don't know when that time or that hour is going to be. Okay, we must be prepared and ready at all times because we don't know the hour of the Lord's return. And being prepared at one time, doesn't guarantee that you'll be paired in the future. Now, I want to go back here for a second. I thought this was a neat little twist. Were all ten uh, brides prepared at one point? I got a nod back here. T tell me more. Okay. They were ready. They, they all had enough oil. If he'd have came at 11 o'clock, they'd have all been good. If he'd have came at 10 o'clock, they'd all been good. If he came at 9 o'clock, they'd all been good. If he'd have came at 8 o'clock. Isn't that interesting? And I think it's interesting that when you think about that, that, that some of us in our lives have been prepared, probably, ready for the maker to come. 
And maybe there's been times in our life when we weren't ready, and we're very thankful that the maker didn't come at that time. Anybody agree or disagree with me on that? Brad? And, and, and so we got to be prepared all the time. We, we can't just uh, be prepared. And, of course, we know people who've fallen away. At one point, were they prepared? They were prepared. But they've fallen away now. And now they're not prepared anymore. And, and, and I want to add that in because sometimes there's a, there's a comforting belief out there that, hey, if you're ever prepared, you're always prepared. No, nah, that's not what the text because these ladies were prepared. I could use this text right here. There was a time period, and if he would have come, they would have been ready, and they would have got married. And it didn't happen. And I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty amazing. Okay, so uh, just repeating this again. We must be prepared and ready at all times because we don't know the hour of the Lord's return. And being prepared at one time does not guarantee that we're prepared in the future. Also, others can't give, uh, give some of their preparedness to get us in the door. I can't give you some of my preparedness. Now, here's the two passages. These are really cool passages. Ezekiel 14, 14. Even though these three, Eze uh, even though these three Ezekiel, I, I copied Ezekiel 14 and then I didn't cut it out. So even though these three, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, their own righteousness, they could not save, uh, could only save themselves, declares the Lord. Isn't that interesting? He says, they were righteous, and they were among this group, but they couldn't save, they couldn't, because of that, they couldn't save the ones that are around them. Just like the five virgins couldn't save the other five virgins. They couldn't do it. They were righteous and prepared, but they couldn't on their own. And then Ezekiel 18, verse 18 the persons whose sins will die, a son will not suffer the punishment for the father's guilt, nor will the father suffer the punishment of the son's guilt. The righteousness of the righteousness will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wickedness will be upon himself. Hey, if your dad is righteous, that doesn't mean you're going to inherit what your dad inherits. If your dad's bad, that doesn't mean you're going to inherit what your dad's bad. And uh, I have heard, and I know you have too, and, it, and it, it bothers me, and I try to explain it to him, but I've heard a lot of people say, you know, my mom, man, she's awesome. And because my mom was awesome and she's going to be in heaven, I, I, I'm good. She's going, to, she's going to take care of me. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad your mom is awesome, but you've got to be awesome too. You, you, can't, you can't ride on that, as they say, the coattail. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that. And this is my last time to say this. We must be prepared and ready at all times because we don't know the hour of the Lord's return. And being prepared at one time doesn't guarantee we'll be prepared in the future. Also, others can't give some of their preparedness to get us in the door because when the door is closed, it's closed. It's final. There is no getting people in. Uh, the, 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 the Roman Catholic Church, you know, uh, I can't think of it, and somebody probably knows it, but like in the 4 and 500s and even the 6 and 700s, you could buy people out of purgatory. Huh? Yeah, indulgences. Hey, Johnny was terrible, wasn't he? And he's probably in torment right now. For $5,000, bam, I can get Johnny into heaven. It sounds good. It would make me feel good. But, but that's not how it works. When the door shuts, it's closed. It's final. You can't buy people out of it. You can't change people in their situation. So Matthew twenty two thirteen. 13. Then the king said to the servant, tie his hands and feet. Throw him in the outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place. It's final. That's what happens. That's where it's at. That's how it takes place. And so here's the good news, though. Here's the good news. David came in in time for the good news. A great day is coming. Revelation 21. 
And I love Revelation 21 because Revelation 21 takes us back to Genesis chapter 1. And the images of the, of the Garden of Eden and, and, and this glorious day and having everybody there and the whole thing about, about what's happening here. There is a great day coming. The, bride, the, the bridegroom, the groom came. And they got married and that was a great day. And they remembered it. And they talked about it. And she probably ragged him for the rest of his life. No, she didn't. For being here at midnight. Why weren't you here at 8 o'clock? Why'd you wait till midnight? I'm sure he had an excellent reason, by the way. But it was a great day. And just like us, there is a great day coming. The question is, though, is are we prepared? How prepared are you? What are you doing to get prepared? Um, and and, and that's, a, that's something we've got to think about. You, you don't just become something overnight. Yes, ma'am. It was too late, yeah. It, it, it was closed on him. His, his time was done. And, and so you can't, you can't be something overnight. Like you can't, you can't just change it. So what are you doing to prepare for whatever it is you're doing? Um, you know, in your life, what are you doing to stay prepared? Hey, I, I, I lost, I remember, uh, I lost a lot of weight one time. I, I figured out this whole weight loss thing, at least I thought I did, and it doesn't work now. It worked in my 30s, it doesn't work in my 40s, but... I remember uh, Jackie Anderson. I love Jackie Anderson. You remember Jackie. And Jackie, Jackie would tell you how it was. I mean, Jackie came up to me. I got down to 170 pounds. I'd lost almost 60 pounds in like a 90-day period. I mean, it was, it was pretty extreme. Y'all might remember it, but I probably don't because I gained it all back. And she came up to me, and she says, are you sick? Is there something wrong? Are you, are you, is that like, you know, thinking I got, you know, got some illness? And I'm like, no, Jackie, I just quit, I just quit eating, you know? Uh, and... Uh, you know, and, and I always thought that was, you know, uh, funny there. But, but I didn't do that overnight. I didn't come in on one Sunday and I weighed, I weighed 236 pounds. And then the next Sunday, I weighed 170 pounds. It doesn't work that way. Trust me, I wish, I wish it did. It took time. And, and it took time for me to prepare. I, and I, I went through a very methodical, very crazy plan. And if you ever want to hear about it, I'll tell you about it. Um, but, but you had to prepare for that. And in our Christian walk, we have to be prepared every day. Because you know what happened when I quit doing what I was doing? I got back to like 210, 215, 220, and I had to go watch the weight again. You had to do it. So, so there are things you have to change in what you do. So any other comments? We've got a couple minutes on this particular parable. No, no. Yeah, yeah. He he knows his sheep, and they weren't his sheep, you know. And the sheep knows their master, and they didn't know each other. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Yes, Debbie. Yeah, oh, a- absolutely. I mean, that, that is uh, uh, one of the amazing things. If you read David's article in this past Sunday's bulletin, read that if you haven't, because it, it talked about this kind of preparedness. But, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the thing, and we prepare for so many things, and we get ready for, uh, but did we get ready for this great day? So, okay, next Wednesday, uh, we'll be doing the labors in the vineyard, Matthew chapter 20.